Well, welcome to the City of Anoka. Thank you everybody for coming out to uh, hear about the uh, Highway 47 railroad grade uh, intersection. Uh, I'd like to specifically thank Governor Walls for holding this press conference. Uh, the City of Anoka greatly appreciates that. We also want to thank the school district for hosting it. Uh, my name is Greg Lee. I'm the city manager for the city of Anoka. Uh, the Highway 47 railroad uh, grade intersection is extremely problematic, not only from a public safety standpoint, but also from an operational standpoint. Highway 47 carries 20,000 vehicles a day on it. That's on a two-lane road. The rail line carries 60 to 80 high-speed freight trains every day, and including uh, in addition to uh, the North Star commuter rail trains as well. So it's extremely problematic. It creates a lot of backups. And along with those traffic backups come the accidents and the injuries. Uh, needless to say, uh, it greatly impacts our emergency response times from our first responders. We have our uh, police chief here and our fire chief here that can attest uh, to the problems that uh, occurs there with uh, the backups that we have on 47. Uh, but perhaps uh, one of the biggest issues with 47, or the most tragic thing is, uh, there has been uh, the death of four youths that occurred on this site. And so that's pretty dramatic, and, and with a, a railroad grade overpass, perhaps this could have been eliminated. So we're looking at uh, possible uh, safety uh, concerns as we move forward with this project. So uh, if the highway, this is, let me back up and state that this railroad crossing is rated the most dangerous crossing in the state of Minnesota. I want to make that really clear. It's rated the most dangerous crossing in the state of Minnesota. So I thank Governor Walls for recognizing that and, and uh, holding this press conference. Uh, so, so as we move forward and looking at the completion of a railroad overpass over the tracks, uh, this is incredibly important to the city of Anoka in terms of uh, public safety. Uh, and so we want to, we're greatly thankful for Governor Walls for uh, recognizing the importance of this project, and we look forward to uh, the needed discussions uh, on improving the city's and the uh, state's infrastructure as we move forward. Thank you. I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Gamash. I want to thank uh, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and Commissioner Anderson Keller here, and also uh, Noka City Manager Lee for being here today to talk about this important issue. Um, as the fourth most populous county in the state of Minnesota, our residents are rightfully concerned about transportation issues all across our county and across the state. Uh, like most of the state of Minnesota, roads and bridges in Anoka County are aging and are in need of repair. Anoka County's population continues to grow, as many of you uh, might be uh, ready aware of, Blaine, uh, places like that, um, have a lot of growth going on. City of Andover, City of Ramsey are also growing. We are grateful that Highway 47 Ferry Street uh, overpass project is included in the list of projects that the Governor, uh, Governor Walls' transportation proposal has. Uh, the separation between Ferry Street and the railway would help traffic move more efficiently and improve safety, as uh, Mr. Lee indicated about the deaths a number of years ago. On average, there are more than 18,000 vehicles that come through this uh, intersection. Every 18 to 36 minutes, a train crosses through the area. Um, this amount of train crossing can have a significant impact on the traffic flow and will create backups all the way back to Highway 10. There are, other se there are several stakeholders involved in this project, um, including residents, the Federal Rail Administration, MnDOT, BNSF, and local governments. Of course, there are other Anoka projects that we are concerned about as well, um, including our Greater Minnesota Project on Highway 10. And uh, that will alleviate congestion on Highway 10 by removing lights, building intersections, and building overpasses over the rail. Uh, we've also had some discussions most recently about Highway 65 going through Blaine as a very important project. Our top concern in Anoka County is the safety of our roads, um, that emergency vehicles can be deployed and get across railroad tracks uh, to reach those emergency issues. So I want to thank again to the administration for being here today and for supporting this critical project. I am pleased Governor Walz's commitment to funding transportation in a sustainable, reliable, and long-term way. We can do better in Minnesota, and we should do better when it comes to our roads and bridges. The cost of important projects like this overpass will only continue to get more expensive the longer we wait to do them. And now I would like to introduce and thank her for being here, uh, Minnesota MnDOT Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher. Thank Commissioner. you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you all for being here today. First, I want to say thank you for our hosts here at the school district. I saw a lot of uh, friends I've known for a long time here, so thank you for being our hosts. I also want to thank the Anoka City Manager again, Greg Lee, County Commissioner Gamash, County Commissioner Mandy Meisner, who's here, County Commissioner Matt Look, who's with us, Mayor of Ramsey, John Letourneau is with us as well. So thank you all for being here. It's very important that we are focused on what I think I'm gonna call today the long overdue overpass. This is a spot where we know we have a safety hazard in the state of Minnesota. The rail grade crossing program, we have two major projects in it, both the Moorhead project and this project here at Ferry Street. And it only highlights that we're going to have a million more people in the state of Minnesota by 2050. And this is an area where we are going to see growth. We're gonna see more people coming and living here, being part of this vibrant community. I was in downtown earlier today, downtown Anoka, and it's really a fabulous place. We wanna keep it that way and keep it growing. Minnesota also has an aging road and bridge problem. When you look at what we have as a grade for our roads and bridges, uh, the independent group, the civil engineer group in the state of Minnesota recently graded our roads and bridges. And our bridges have a C, our roads have a D minus, our transit system also has a C minus. And I would just draw your attention to this, to have a million more people come to our state and not have a better grade. As a parent, I would be disappointed. As a MnDOT commissioner, I am disappointed, and I want to make sure we're correcting this. This is why it's so important that the governor has proposed a sustainable transportation bill that invests in our aging roads and bridges. Over 50% of our state roads are 50 years old or older. Over 40% of our state bridges are also of that age. MnDOT estimates our gap alone to be $18 billion over the next 20 years. It's important that the funding of these projects be done in a sustainable way for us to be able to have the world-class transportation system we need. Whether you're getting to school, to work, or to play, we need to be able to do that. And there is a cost to doing nothing. And that's important for folks to remember here. The cost on a project like this is the loss, of, the potential loss of economic opportunity and activity, the cost potentially to lives, whether it's EMS responding to a call or actual crossing. But it has a daily cost to Minnesotans, and that's over $1,000 in a year of what it costs for a Minnesotan to sit in congested traffic to hit one of those potholes that we're seeing a lot more of right now. And although Minnesotans are going to be asked to pay a bit more in this program, they're going to get a lot out of it. They're going to get a lot in the way of being able to move forward. And here in Anoka County, I'm also pleased to say that $24 million more would come to Anoka County over four years because of the cost sharing program that happens. When you pay your fuel tax, a portion of that tax comes back to you, guaranteed in the state constitution. We want to make sure that we are doing well by all Minnesotans, bringing Minnesotans together with this one Minnesota plan, and our road and bridge and transportation system needs the investment. I'm pleased to introduce to you both the governor of the state of Minnesota, Tim Walls, and the lieutenant governor, Peggy Flanagan. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Commissioners and City Manager. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to lift up uh, this important investment in the state of Minnesota. So whether you live uh, in St. Louis Park, like I do, or in St. Cloud, Minnesotans know that there's critical need to invest in our community's roads and bridges. Whether it's a crumbling bridge or a dangerous pothole, we simply cannot ignore the reality of our infrastructure. Minnesota's transportation system is aging and struggling to keep up with the demands of our growing population. 
Pavement deterioration is a serious risk facing our state highway system. And the hundreds of miles of roads that are in poor condition cost the average Minnesotan, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, over $1,000 a year in gas, lost time, and car repairs. And as a mom of a six-year-old kiddo, I also would like to remind us that that is time that we're not spending with our families and we're stuck in traffic instead. We know that the county and city governments have long-standing transportation needs. Most of the miles of roadway in the state and co are county roads and city streets, which are used for daily trips to and from work. Our agriculture, manufacturing, and service industries rely greatly on these local roads to move products and services. That's why we think it's time to stop kicking the can down the road when it comes to transportation funding. We need to modernize our transportation system by repairing and replacing aging infrastructure and using materials and processes that will extend the life of our roads, not only for the sake of our economy, but for the safety of everyone. Whether you're riding the bus or driving to work, Minnesotans should be able to rely on safe, reliable roads. And to offset uh, the costs uh, to lower and middle income Minnesotans will pay in fuel taxes, we propose increasing the working family credit. By offsetting these costs for families who rely on transportation to provide for their families, they will be a better able to move to and from work, connect with other parts of the state, and depend on the smooth and reliable movement of goods and services. Our proposal also supports jobs, providing new funds for construction projects that will employ thousands of construction construction workers and engineers in good paying jobs for years to come. Today we're in Anoka because the people of Anoka are ready for solutions. Solutions that will make their community safer and their roads more dependable. Uh, we're here to say that we see you, we hear you, and we are ready to work with you. And with that, I'd like to introduce Governor Tim Walls. Thank you. Super. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Commissioner, thank you for your, uh, your work, your vision, and your leadership. And, and to the mayor and the, the county commissioners and uh, city administrators, thank you for doing the work. Thank you for the ones who, uh, who actually have to fill the potholes, who have to be accountable for them, and to respond to local businesses about what we can do to uh, promote growth. Uh, thank you to the folks who are here, and we, you heard a little bit about the accident here. There might even be some folks in this room who responded in 2003 to that accident and loss of lives. Um, the thing is, is that they were responding to the accident in 1972 that first brought this to the Capitol and said, fix this. So this is a 50-year project. Uh, folks in this room have come to Washington, D.C. when I served on the House Transportation Committee advocating for this project. The community knew. Um, and so, yeah, we're out here today because this is not an issue about dollars and cents. This is not about just a transportation package or a gas tax. This is about real lives and real things. And I have brought it out here, out under the dome of the Capitol, because I am done trying to watch somebody jam an ideological peg into what is truly a, a practical situation that needs to be solved. Uh, if there was a way to do this without having a dependable stream of funding to fix these projects, it would have been done in 1972. It has not been done. It continues to come back to the community and at the point right now, as all of Minnesotans, this community is valuable to the economic vitality of the entire state. So the idea that there will be some type of voluntary fix or that we will force this back onto property owners and property tax owners will undermine the economic viability of this community and put people's safety at risk. That's why we need a comprehensive plan with dependable resources that go to exactly those projects. And as you heard the commissioner say, these projects are 100% guaranteed if it comes to the gas tax and the registration fees that go back to roads and bridges, and our bonding goes exactly back to these grade separation projects and things that improve local streets. Um, I'd also like to mention that uh, former Transportation Commissioner L. Tinklenburg is here in the room. Uh, I Much of what I've learned about the North Metro area I've learned from L. Tinklenburg. <laughs> Um, and for some of you in this room who know, I served for, uh, for several years as the, uh, the first sergeant of the local guard unit. And so these historic issues, you heard the numbers, these are real people, this is waiting in traffic. So that's why it's incumbent upon us, and I think many of you know, uh, there was no secret involved in this. We ran strongly on the idea of community prosperity being grounded in having a world-class transportation system, roads, bridges, transit, bus service, uh, everything that we need to do to make Minnesota competitive, make Minnesota safer. And what we did is felt that there was a need and an honesty that had to go with, how are you going to fund this? So that $18 billion that the commissioner talked about, 
That's the program that we put together, and that's where we came up with the numbers. And I will uh, let people know that when this it goes into a very simplistic argument. This is not an argument about a gas tax or no gas tax. This is about safe roads that aren't D minus and traffic grade separations that are safe and move people efficiently or staying with the status quo because there is no plan to address these. There has not been a plan for 50 years to address them that actually lets us move forward. This plan makes sure that we don't have to come back at this again, that we have that dependable source, that we've used the data that we needed to have gathered, and that it is targeted at these very projects. All of these things will create jobs in our community, safer transportation system, quicker movement of goods, people, and ideas across Minnesota, and set us up to be that leading state that we know we need to be into the future. So we are out in our communities advocating um, for the case that that is being advocated to me for decades from county commissioners, from mayors, uh, city council members, uh, business people who came and make the case for where this has come from. We have put this in front of the legislature, and I am here to tell you right now, the alternative response of no is not a plan. No will not build this overpass. No will not make our roads safer. No will not fix the potholes. And no is what you've got for the last 50 years. So we're here today uh, as a team to make the case. My job is to make sure that we build the capacity to be able to do this for Minnesota, and that's exactly what we intend to do. And, and I remind folks, um, this is not a unique situation to Minnesota. 26 states in the last five years have raised their gas tax. A dozen more are doing it now. The Republican governor of Ohio just proposed 18 cents. Last year, the Republican governor of Iowa with a Republican House and a Republican Senate passed a gas tax. Uh, and the state of Michigan proposed 45 cents. So uh, this seems a little bit less than that. And uh, mm -hmm. their needs are there. And uh, I, uh, I couldn't have found the, uh, the timing of this any different, but the folks standing up here would say, we are not surprised one bit because this happens every day. Those of you who know me, we started a couple minutes late because I was stuck by the train trying to get into it. Um, <laughs> that comes through. So um, this proposal makes sound fiscal sense. It's adherence to our Constitution. It makes sense. And, and I have to tell you that I haven't seen this type of movement at the federal level where I went and testified, some of you know, on behalf of the National Governors Association, where there is finally the movement for the first time since 1993 that the federal government is thinking about making their investment. And I just remind people of what it means when you don't budget for inflationary needs and you don't take into cost a million more people being added when the last time the federal government did a move on the federal uh, the highway trust fund it was 1993 and they have not moved it since then since that time the buying power of the federal gas tax and the highway trust fund has lost 41 percent of its buying power so if it feels like we're getting about half of what we need to get done you're about right it's 41 percent that is being pulled out federally and this is certainly a case that the states are being forced to step up and we're glad to do it minnesota needs to step up needs to create a world crest transportation system needs to respond uh, to Highway 47 and Ferry Street because it truly is about lives, it's about commerce, and again, Lieutenant Governor said it right, um, if you get a little few cents off your gas and you're idling stuck in traffic, not being home with your family, uh, you're not really saving anything. And the fact of the matter is, economically, the cost of doing nothing on transportation costs the state billions in economic activity, lost productivity, and lost wages. So um, we're glad to answer any questions you might have, and I want to thank all the folks up here who are making the case to uh, a safer, uh, more efficient Minnesota. So please. Uh, we'll leave the podium up here. He can come and stand in front of people and tell them how he's going to get this done. Because for 50 years, they've not told you that. Now, he can tell you that it's going to take it from general funds, but the school district folks in here knows that your property taxes are going to go up because that's going to come down. Your county commissioners have to make wheelage tax adjustments. And the fact is, is that we are trying to continue down an ideological path that 26 other states, Republican governors and Republican House and Senate across this nation, have come to the idea that it's actually a very conservative principle to invest in transportation that actually saves people money and grows economic growth. We've got a bunch of folks who have decided that no is the answer to everything. I'm waiting on a disaster bill to refill the 10,000. I'm waiting for him to take up the opioid bill, I'm waiting for the Senate to get the hands-free bill. That's just the easy stuff that should have been done. 
But now we're going to talk about today taking money out of education on a pipe dream that is going to take money and not even give it to parents, but give it for-profit organizations. Well, that's not what Minnesotans are talking about. They're talking about the bridge. They're talking about the grade separation. So my message to that is, is that um, as a Senate, who none of them stood in front of the voters in 2018, they need to come with me more than no, more than no. The safety of Minnesotans is not a, 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 a random type of situation that we can just mess with. This situation had been kicked down the road for far too long. And when I stood in front of the voters last year, I made it very clear, and let's, let's not, you know, again, there's many of you in this room who heard that. Uh, I'm not sure you ever heard anybody run for governor and said, we need a, a robust transportation plan and I'm gonna have to ask for a gas tax to be able to get that done. I did that. So I would tell the senator, come here, answer these questions, put forward your plan, come up with the $18.17 billion um, and how that is going to be directly responsible for roads and bridges back to these communities. If not, the fact of the matter is, is we're at the point right now, they can own the situation you see right outside. Um, I would rather have us to other to own this. If this has been such a longstanding problem, why was this not addressed at that point? Why is this project still languishing. Yeah, this project has been being addressed and it, it's came up every time. It's because there's not the courage to talk about what it's going to cost to do this. There's not a courage again about 50 year roads. Many of us are benefiting from what previous generations invested and they built these roads and now we know we have to keep them up. We haven't done that. But when you go to the capital and tell people they're going to get a tax cut because everything's fine on these. And I'm not telling you that we can't be more efficient. We can't get better uh, outcomes. We should do that. I just think there was not the political will to do this. Because the thing that's interesting about this debate over uh, my transportation proposal is no one has debated whether it needs to be done or not. Not a single person said, this is crazy he's talking about fixing the roads and bridges. This is outrageous that he thinks that we need a transportation package. Not a single senator has said that. What they've said is, we're not interested in paying for it. And so my, I'm, I'm looking for it. I'm waiting for the plan. But just, back, just real quickly, back to this project, though. Why was this not prioritized before now when billions were approved in, in 06? Yeah. Does anybody have so, an answer to that? So, <laughs> thank you. Well, you were there. Uh, I was so. there <laughs> in 2008, <laughs> yes. And uh, so there are a couple things about that. We were in divided government at that point, and the bonding bills that were passed during that period of time were rather slim. And I don't know that this was actually proposed in Governor Pawlenty's bonding bill. I, as the leader of the House at the time, we passed an eight and a half cent gas tax increase. And I will say that Senator Abler voted for that. And we worked together on that. And we will continue to work together to see if there is a place of agreement here. I really believe that people, the governor is right. No one, no one in this state is debating whether we need transportation funding and dedicated transportation funding. It is really about how it's gonna be done. And so that, that eight and a half cents, it was a lot about our failing bridges at the time after the 35W bridge collapse. We, I believe, that's why, the, that's why on this report card, bridges have a C and roads still have a D plus because a lot of the resources went into fracture critical bridges, helping s both the local governments around the state as well fix their bridges. So that was one of the big, big issues. Uh, I would like to say that had the indexing portion been successful on that bill, we would not be in the same spot today. Had indexing of about a penny and a half or penny point three been in place in 2008, which was part of the original proposal and bill, then we would not be nearly as far behind, and this project may well have gotten done at that point. Uh, Senator, Senator, Senator Abler and I are going to have lunch in downtown Anoka soon and continue to discuss things. I invited him to come. Um, he assured me that any day you spend some time in Anoka is a fabulous day, and I can tell him I agree. So we will continue to have this conversation with senators. Do you have any Republican votes? Uh, I, I believe that it is early in the session, 
and that members are still learning, both senators and representatives are learning how important the ability to return to the general fund $450 million every two years is. Because there are a lot of wishes and wants out there right now, and without that $450 million and seven cents of dedicated transportation funding, which is what we're talking about here as part of the package, then that list is cut real short, fast. So, that no so, far. so we are in conversation. Governor, to, to Mary's point, uh, there are any number of locally important projects around the state that you could highlight to put a face on this, that they, money goes back. Yeah. You chose to come to Anoka. Last week you were in a school in a Republican Center's district, and then you were talking health care in a Republican <clears throat> Center's district. Is there any coincidence that you're... No, you're no coincidence. Home? No coincidence. I'll be at other places too. The fact of the matter is we're going to go to places where people have these projects, they need to be done, and ask them what their plan is to them. So I, I think it's important because obviously you're going to follow up and ask the questions of what the plan is, how do we get this done. This is how you go about building uh, collaboration and coalition. I, here's the thing. I'm standing here and, and I keep telling them this. I'll take the heat for this. I'll I'll take for putting this plan forward because it's the one that we've uh, that I, I proposed and I put forward. But I can tell you, you're certainly welcome to join me out here when we cut the ribbon on this new bridge. If that's what it, I want us to build bipartisan collaborations to get this done. These are jobs in Minnesota too. Don't forget about that. Over this last week, two of the nation's four major refineries went into maintenance mode, so gas prices went up 21 cents. Not a single penny of that. Goes to minute, it goes to the oil companies and it goes to the refineries. None of them are creating jobs and it fluctuated that much. It'll come back down once the maintenance is done. That's the nature of it. These are dedicated funding that goes back and, as we said, saves money. So, uh, no, I'm going to go out to these projects. And this one's personal, too, because this one has a history of fatalities. Uh, it's personal for me because I spent time up here and listened to soldiers tell me why they were late for formation because they were stuck by trains. Um, <laughs> some of the times it was true. Um, <laughs> But, but it's one that, and, and to be very honest with you, this is what citizen activism looks like. These county commissioners have been coming to see me in D.C. for the past 12 years before I had this job. They're right here telling me this and preventing and putting this out. This is what citizen activism looks like, and, and it's why we were up in Moorhead, too. Um, in that case, we have uh, Democrats representing that, but that's a project that I'm highlighting that's really important, too, a great separation project that has people, everybody in Moorhead, just like everybody in NOCA, has the stories about what they missed because the train was almost through and backed up again, and uh, you're, you, you think they're doing that to irritate you, or why is BNSF doing that? So that's the, that's the point. So, Governor, I, I served on the Transportation Advisory Board for three terms, and it was an honor to serve that. And I was a pretty strong preservationist, and some of the folks here in, in the city of Anoka, particularly in engineering, can tell you that the way that roads are reconstructed with overlays, um, we have a very serious situation of reflective cracking that occurs just weeks. Or Matt, County Commissioner Matt Luke can tell you I whine about this all the time. I would really like to see that when we do these road rebuilds and we do these reconstructions, that we don't just put lipstick on it. Yeah. And it looks pretty for a year or two. And then, you know, it's good advice. four years from it's now, good this all comes back. And it's how we're thinking about, too, on the electrification of the transportation grid, and which is, of course, part of this plan. That, and, and I, again, we recognize the buying power of the gas tax will decrease as, you know, if we don't roll back fuel efficiency standards, which I think is a really bad idea to roll back fuel efficiency standards. But we're thinking about that for what that modern transportation system, because I think it's incumbent upon us. Minnesota's economic vitality was predicated on visionary transportation at the time and investments. We have one of the most vast and uh, most connected transportation systems in the nation, and that takes a little more upkeep, but it also gained us great economic leverage that came with that. So I hear you, and I think it's good advice. Governor, do you think that the, the, not just the voters, but the drivers, the people who are buying gasoline for their vehicles every day in this area, do you think they support this? Uh, and saying it another way, does, does the Republican senator who represents this district, is he out of step with the voters in this district? Yeah, well, I, I think part of it is that there's, there's uh, again, I, have, I talk, have talked to people who, and I just assume that it's misinformation. The, the commissioner and I carry around our constitutions now. Um, because they were being told that I would support this, Tim, but I don't want that money going to trains in the Twin Cities. It doesn't. We need those two, but we have that as part of our plan. So uh, we know that Minnesotans support this. 
uh, that Minnesotans supported raising the gas tax before. There's certainly a concerted effort to try and make this a conversation about the gas tax, but I'll remind you again, this is a conversation about having the transportation system that we know we need and want or not having it. Because again, I will, this is a perfect pro, uh, uh, example of one of these projects. For 50 years, it hasn't gotten done. Well, just to, to broaden this out, if I could follow up on that, uh, you, of course, are not unfamiliar with the transportation issues from your work in Congress, and right. particularly in your district, with, to make this statewide. Are you surprised, after having done a deep dive since November, are you surprised in any way uh, with the condition of Minnesota transportation now that you are totally in it? Yeah, I think uh, I understood it in southern Minnesota. Of course, Highway 14 is the poster child of that, of southern Minnesota. The, the Winona Bridge was the, because uh, Highway 14, uh, everybody in southern Minnesota, and I, I say that not hyperbole, Margaret's cousin, my next door neighbor, Charlie Ingman, we all have stories who got killed on that road. Um, so I knew it was there. I think theoretically I understood it, but now seeing it and going to each of these projects and hearing it, the, I think the good thing for me was and why this was such a part of why I, uh, of what I was running for and what Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and I were talking about in community prosperity was that time in Congress on the Transportation Committee and that time of meeting with county commissioners and just this relentless, the Highway 14 coalition, you know, we're building these coalitions, the Highway 60 coalition, the Winona Bridge. Uh, and again, when it's done right and going back to this preservation point, this was MnDOT at its best, a historic bridge. It's on the stamp of our sesquicentennial. It was the poster, literally the poster of Minnesota sesquicentennial, the beautiful arc bridge over the Mississippi River at Winona with Sugarloaf in the background. And when we were getting ready to build that, the community was deeply worried about it changing the character of that. We go to a modern bridge with a flat deck plate and, and not the historic nature of it. MnDOT, with community engagement we talked about, brought in everyone, we worked relentlessly for several months, came back and created a plan that kept that bridge in place for pedestrian and bike crossing that's an economic driver and created the new bridge right next to it. So when you are on the river paddling or boating and you look down, the silhouette is exactly the same. With a modern bridge, it kept everything in place and the landing into the community worked with businesses to not interfere with that. That's what we have the potential of doing. And, and the situation, and this is fascinating when you think about the cost of not doing anything, after the I-35W bridge fell and the Gusset Place issue came up, the Winona Bridge was the same, deny, the same design. I was down there with Jim Overstar at the time when they closed the Winona Bridge. Every single day was a million dollars of impact and economic activity into that. And in Winona, I believe it was a 57 mile drive around mm -hmm. to try and come in of what was happening. So that waiting and what can happen. And if we wait till these situations, and we saw it the other day, we had to clo lane, close lanes on I-35W. We had to do it during the day because of what it takes. It's not, I'll, I'll let you do the engineering. Um, <laughs> I'll let so, someone else do the yeah, engineering. <laughs> but, but those are things. So I, I think in answer to your question, it's just much more visceral. And I think that's what I'm trying to get out there, that this issue for Anoka is this one, but every single community has that. And we're in it together. Because again, I guess you could do this. Those who say that, you know, just some slapdash that we'll have a, a voluntary gas tax or something at, at the pump or whatever. Okay, so we leave the $45 million cost to the citizens of uh, uh, here in Anoka. Well, that's, uh, that's about $12,000 for every family of four, a little more than that. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, I benefit as a citizen of Mankato when Anoka's economy is working well. And so I'm still trying to make it personal for people to understand what this is. And I think, again, there is no good reason is I don't want to pay it. Well, if I could get this bridge done and not have the gas tax, I'm with you on that. That's exactly, <laughs> that's, a, that's the same plan I want. But hope and ideological rigidness is not a plan to get the bridge done. So, so Brian. Governor, to the local officials behind you, it's apparent that you support the end result, which is an overpass. Are you on board? Maybe by show of hands with the input, the gas tax, and the, the taffies. Man, that is putting them on the spot. You're talking about your transportation yeah. plan. It's a, it's, a, it's a package. And, and it is. Both ends of it. Are you supportive of the gas tax increase? Someone want to get up there? And I can comment. It? I support the project. I've been can here. Can you get over here? Yeah. Uh, Noka County Commissioner Matt, look, I'm here in support of the project, this project. You know, I'm thinking through kind of comments uh, that I might say here today. Um, when you door knock 
and you talk to people about projects, sometimes projects aren't fully understood why they're necessary. Perhaps it's a future, project, uh, future transportation need. This project here, everyone, everyone knows the purpose of this because every single day you're stopped here, every single day you're put at risk. Not every single day, but quite often there's gate failures and uh, it's a problem. So how that gets funded, I do have some ideas on how that can be funded, uh, but uh, as far as the uh, overall statewide funding of transportation needs, that's higher than my pay grade and certainly I don't get paid the big bucks for that, so. Are you urging your senator to support the full package of the gas tax increase? I'm urging my senators to help fund this project. Will this project, will this project not happen without a 20 cent gas tax increase? I, I can, it's such a I can high priority. So, so it is correct. This project will not happen without the gas tax. And so, uh, so because, because it is going to be funded with a portion of the five cents, so five cents four times over two years gets us to 20 cents. About three to four cents of that will help to pay for the debt on these new projects. And this is what we're talking about here. Those are trunk highway bonds. They are, they are paid for with the dedicated source of the gas tax. And that's why people need to understand that there is not an alternate proposal for funding this project that does not include the debt payment using the gas tax. But if it's one of the most dangerous intersections in the state, why is it not prioritized with existing money? It is being prioritized. So here's the thing. There, there, are, there, there, there is no new money right now. And without the new money, you can't get to these next two projects, which are Moorhead and the Ferry Street Crossing in Anoka. So the, the issue here is those two projects alone are, I think, a total of $92 million. I just want to say that again, $92 million. We need a way to pay for them. Governor, when, uh, yeah. when you were in Washington, I'm sure you heard from, uh, say, Pentagon officials all the time, we need X, Y, Z. And you said, okay, but let's have a reality check. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm asking, when they say they need $18 million, I mean, why should Minnesotans trust that? The, the Society of Civil Engineers? Well, civil engineers have a stake in this. They have a self-interest. But why should we trust uh, a bunch of road-building bureaucrats who say we need more money to build roads? Did you drive on 35 today? I mean, some of this is, is just, I mean, there's some, part of it is, is with eyes. I mean, I guess we could get into this situation, and we may be entering a, a phase of politics on this, is if you don't trust the deficiency on the bridges that were tested, and you think we're just telling you those are deficient bridges so we can get more money, um, boy, it's tough to govern. Uh, it's certainly tough to have a democracy because we have independent uh, verifications of these. We have independent engineers. And no, I, I, and there, there's a, there is an argument to be made. We have, we have uh, an incredible infrastructure system, but we could start turning things back to gravel. That is an option to try and do some of these things. Um, I just think I, I stood out here on this road that was there. This one, we, we came to places like this to make that visceral connection that these types of things need to be done. And we'll take you to a lot more if you choose to continue to come. Um, and there's simply not the money there. I mean, if there was, they would, they would tell you, and I have to believe, we had, we had a Republican governor didn't get this one done. We had a Democratic governor didn't get this one done. We had a Reform Party governor didn't get some of this done. And, and I've told Republicans this. I, I really think you should let me take the bite out of this, and, and I'm willing to own this to go. We index to this inflation. We will have that dedicated funding source that's based on, again, I, I hope I'm, you, you know, I... We re-verify where we're getting information. This is what the cost is. That's what they tell us. I'm every day talking to the commissioner. Can we get more efficiencies out of this? Can we get more miles for the dollars we're getting? Are there ways for us to make sure that we're not window dressing highways, that we're building them deeper and better? Um, are we truly thinking about what we need if we're going to move to electrification or what transit looks like? So we're asking those hard questions. Uh, I put these numbers out there. I've said that that is. I, I think there is, and I would challenge all of you. What is the alternative? And again, I have yet to hear that they've questioned me on the need. If that is, if that is a question that they're out there, that they think that I'm making up these numbers and we don't really need to do this with infrastructure, I would welcome their data and that d debate. But it has not happened yet that no one's saying that. They're saying, no, no, we need these roads. We just 
have a different way to pay for it. Uh, I, I haven't seen it yet. Folks, we have time for one more question before we conclude the formal press conference, and then the governor will be available for a little while longer to answer general questions, and we'll ask our guests to step away. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I, I might be drilling down way too deep, but are you hearing from Minnesotans about potholes? I do. Uh, I do. Um, Yes, and I think it's important for them to, to recognize, you know, why these are happening. Um, I know that the commissioner and her engineers have been talking about this and why they fix them during the day. Uh, these types of maintenance things, and it might have go to the gentleman's question, is, is that fixing a pothole and patching it will only make sure that it's probably good till next winter, and then it'll be again, and it'll be a little broader. So yes, we're hearing a lot about it. I, uh, I went to the state basketball tournament, and one of the officials who was officiating the Roseau uh, Caledonia game uh, said they barely made it to the game because they blew a tire and bent a rim in a pothole. And so I don't go search, well, I do go searching a little bit for these stories. Um, I'll be totally honest with you on that. But they come to me more often yeah. than not. So, all right. Thank you to the commissioners who are here. We'll wait and take your other questions.